Hello and welcome to the session on the modeling of 2D loading and supports in the Plaxis LE software. My name is Murray Fredland and I will be walking you through the methodology today. Today will involve a discussion of the use of loadings and supports in slope stability modeling. We will end with a summary of what we have discussed in this video. As a brief overview, a building foundation is known to transmit loads into the subsurface. This is true of any load placed on the ground surface. Any one of these loads can influence stability. And since the limit equilibrium method only deals with statics, the primary focus is on static loading. Dynamic loading can be approximated, however, through the application of an equivalent static load. This video will also cover methods of representing internal supports to the slope in order to increase stability. In the picture below, we have a slope that is stabilized and the factor of safety increased to design acceptable specifications by installation of piles in the slope. So let's firstly look at loading methods within the software. There are three primary methods of loading in the software, two of which are external and seismic, which is internal loading. Point loads are applied at a single external point in the model and distributed loads as well are applied to an upper surface in a numerical model to represent a building or a static traffic load or some other type of load of a structure on the ground surface. Point loads are considered in the analysis as an external force that is applied to a specific point on the ground surface, as shown in the above figure. In the analysis, the line load is applied only to the slice on which it acts and is considered in the overall summation of vertical and horizontal forces as well as the summation of moments. A distributed load is ultimately converted to an equivalent line load for each slice on which it is, it is applied in the model. These same principles hold for a 3D analysis as well. The models above show the application of a building load on the left and a potential static traffic load on the right-hand model. Distributed loads are applied over an area and the stress applied is reduced to forces that are applied to individual, individual slices. Distributed load forces applied outside of a trial slip surface have no effect on the solution. It should be noted that distributed loads could potentially be activating or resisting of movement. For example, in the right-hand figure, if the distributed load is applied to the top of the slope, it would definitely lower the factor of safety. If the distributed load is applied below the centroid of the slope, then the load may have the effect of stabilizing the slope. It is often of importance to consider earthquake loads in the analysis of the stability of slopes. The common method for considering seismic stability of slopes is the pseudo-static approach, which originated in about 1920. The application of this approach in slope stability has been attributed to, to Terzaghi in 1950. In the most common form, the pseudo-static approach replaces the effect of an earthquake by a static inertia force which could potentially be applied horizontally and or vertically to the center of gravity of a potentially unstable soil mass. The vertical component is often ignored as the horizontal component is the most critical. The pseudo-static approach depends primarily on the value of k sub h. A number of researchers have suggested appropriate values of k sub h over the years and, are, and these are outlined in the following table. It can be seen that there's a fairly wide range of suggested values between 0.1 and up to 0.5, with 0.5 representing a catastrophic event. Values between 0.1 to 0.2 represent a severe to violent event. It can be seen also that some researchers such as Markison, Jansen, and Heinz Griffin link the k sub h coefficient to the maximum acceleration at the ground surface. The lack of a global standard, however, in this area adds to the challenges of the analysis. The pseudo-static approach combined with limit equilibrium is popular because it's simple and it's a direct method. It's also easy to integrate into a limit equilibrium analysis as it involves a simple application of a horizontal force. There are a number of significant disadvantages with the method that should be considered. Firstly, it replaces a very dynamic earthquake action with a permanent force acting in the horizontal direction. This may be uh, uh, considered an oversimplification. It should also be noted that the method ignores the dynamic response of any structure on the ground and the frequency content of the seismic movement. The method is also subjective to the choice of the pseudostatic coefficient, and there is currently little consensus in the industry on what this seismic coefficient should be. 
The method also results ultimately in the critical slip surface going deep, and this is especially true when analyzing slope failures in clay material. The method also ignores an increase in pore water pressures and degradation resistance in clays. The method also struggles from a lack of consensus on what is a choice of an ultimate factor of safety for design that's appropriate, uh, and as well the appropriate assessment of the critical slip surface location. As a result of some of the aforementioned weaknesses, there has been an interest in pursuing the assessment of seismic stability using the finite element method. The finite element method allows consideration of dynamic responses in terms of resulting stresses and deformations as a function of time and can be considered a rigorous analysis. However, finite element method analysis is sometimes avoided in industry due to the long execution times and the difficulty in mapping out the detailed constitutive models required for the analysis. So Plaxis LE has implemented research performed at the University of Sherbrooke alongside the Ministry, Quebec Ministry of Transport for seismic analysis of soil slopes using a spectral pseudostatic procedure. The interest of this research program was to have a method which provided reasonable consistency with detailed funded element analysis, however, but provided within the context of an LEM limit equilibrium analysis method that is conducive to industry application. The method implements a function of applying k sub h as a decaying function with depth. This method brings the calculation of horizontal forces closer to reality and has been shown to successfully match detailed finite difference calculations in terms of the slip location and the resulting factor of safety. So a number of examples were set up and solved both with finite difference method and with the spectral pseudostatic method implemented in Plaxis LE and the location and the resulting factor safety were demonstrated to compare favorably to the finite difference detailed method. The advantage of the limit equilibrium based approaches is that the calculation time for the analysis is significantly reduced both in terms of model setup time and analysis time. So Plaxis LE implements a number of methods for modeling internal supports in the software. Support methods implemented include end, end anchored, geotextiles, grouted tiebacks, micropiles, and several versions of soil nails, as well as a user defined model. In this video, we will be going over the implementation of anchored supports, geotextiles, grouted tiebacks, and micropiles. The user is encouraged to review the help documentation for further details on the other methods. The figure on the right also shows a slope that has been stabilized both with anchors and with micropiles. Each loading condition may be specified as active or passive in the respective dialog. The active or passive specification determines whether the support resistance is utilized in the equation to decrease the driving forces, i.e. it's active, or to increase the resisting forces, i.e. it's passive. The orientation of the force is determined for end anchored, grouted tieback, soil nails, and micropiles as being parallel to the support or tangent to the slip surface for micropiles. A number of force orientations including tangent to the slip surface, tangent to the support, or a bisector can be specified for geotextiles and user-defined supports. One of the simplest types of anchors in the software is an end-anchored support. In this support method, the force is applied along the anchor at a constant level regardless of where the slip surface intersects the body of the support. It should be noted that if the slip surface does not cut through the anchor, then the anchor is effectively not considered in the analysis. The force is then calculated as the tensile capacity divided by the out-of-plane spacing. The out-of-plane spacing measurement is an attempt to approximate 3D conditions in a 2D model. And it should be noted that effectively anchors are point loads. In 2D models, they are plate members that are reduced by the spacing value entered in the field. The geotextile support type in the software can be used to simulate multiple forms of flexible planar reinforcement. Examples include textiles, fabrics, meshes, grids, strips, membranes, and synthetic steel strips. The geotextile supports can be easily and graphically placed on the interior of any model. Again, they only become effective if the slip surface passes through the geotextile support. With the geotextile, the strip coverage is calculated according to the width of each slip and the spacing between the strips in the slope. 
In this manner, the 2D approximation of 3D conditions is approximated. It is also possible with geotextiles to specify the method by which shear strength of the geotextile is calculated. The software implements both linear and hyperbolic shear strength functions. It should also be noted that the slip surface must pass directly through the geotextile in order to engage the shear strength of the geotextile. Grouted tiebacks are a common form of slope reinforcement where an anchor is surrounded by a grouted portion for a certain length of the anchor. With the grouted tieback, the forces are assessed at the point at which the member cuts the slip plane. The length of the grout above the slip plane and below the slip plane is significant. It's also important to note that if the slip surface does not cut the anchor object, then the anchor has no effect on the analysis. The inputs required for a grouted tieback can be seen in this dialog. The user must enter force application in terms of whether it is active or passive, the pullout strength, capacity and spacing, which includes out of plane spacing, tensile capacity and plate capacity, and lastly the bond length, which can be entered either as a percent of length or as a fixed length measurement in the units of the problem. It should be remembered that for a grouted tieback there is not a single method for calculating failure, but rather three failure modes, which consists of pullout, tensile capacity failure, or stripping failure. The graph on the right side of the screen illustrates the different failure modes which dominate along different lengths of the anchor. The distance represents distance into the slope, and the surface of the slope is on the left-hand side of the graph. Therefore, if the failure plane is deep and near the end of the anchor, the dominating failure mode is a pullout failure. If the failure plane is near the surface, then the stripping failure becomes the dominant failure mode. On each trial slip surface, all three failure modes are calculated and the minimum of the three modes is applied to the slip surface. It should also be noted that stripping failure will only occur when the plate capacity exceeds the tensile capacity. And it's also worth noting that if the tieback bond strength is specified as material dependent, then the pullout force and stripping force are determined by the bond strength of each segment of the bonded length which passes through different materials. There is also a frictional option with grouted tiebacks which allows a frictional material model to be incorporated into the calculations. Micropiles are vertical support members that can be used to simulate micropiles or piles. Micropile support is treated slightly different than other pile types of support in that primarily shear force along the sliding plane is the primary consideration. With the micropile support method, resistance is assumed to be constant and traverse to the support direction rather than parallel to the support direction. Therefore, only shear failure can happen transversely through the pile. It should be noted that tensile, pullout, or stripping failures are not potential failure mechanisms for the micropile support type. In summary, we have covered that point loads, distributed loads, and seismic loading conditions can be applied in the Plaxis LE software. There is a diverse variety of support methods available to model the potential strengthening of the slope. There are also methods for calculation for end anchored supports, geotextiles, grouted tiebacks, and micropiles, which are outlined in this presentation. There are also other support options available in the software, and the theory is explained more fully in the theory manual. So thank you for your time and your attention today. This concludes the video on loading and supports.